Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia, and I'm also currently a Danish Diabetes and Endocrine Academy Visiting Professor at the University of Copenhagen. Now, the idea behind Inside Exercise is to bring to you the who's who of exercise research, so exercise physiology, exercise metabolism, and exercise and health. And indeed, today I bring to you Professor Russ Heppel from the University of Florida, who's an expert on mitochondria. When we think about the muscle's mitochondria, we tend to focus on energy production. So the use of carbohydrate and fat predominantly to produce ATP. And that ATP then is used for contraction and other processes within the cell. But there are other things going on in the mitochondria as well. And that's what we focused on. One in particular is the maintenance of the mitochondria's permeability. There are situations such as alterations in calcium and reactive oxygen species within the mitochondria, which can affect the mitochondria's permeability. So mitochondrial permeability transition can occur in response to things such as ischemia reperfusion injury. So for example, when you have a heart attack, well, hopefully you don't, but if one has a heart attack, there's a reduction in blood flow to the to part of the heart, which is the ischemia. Therefore, you get less oxygen delivery. But then you can get, for example, if you have a stent put in, you'll have a sudden increase in flow, and that can cause um, problems as itself. So reactive oxygen species production, et cetera. And it's like mitochondrial permeability transition plays a role with that, which where essentially the mitochondria becomes less efficient and also can actually disintegrate. So swell and then burst. I found it really interesting. I think you would too. So stick around. Hi, Russ. How are you? Thanks for coming on. Um, this is going to be a bit of a, an interesting one and in, in a, in a progression. From, you know, I've had quite a few people on talk about the mitochondria. Um, and even with aging, we're going to talk about aging today. But, you know, we've tended to, to focus on what we not tend to think about normally with the mitochondria. So producing ATP. So you know, taking energy from food and getting it into something we can use for contraction, et cetera. Now, tell me a little bit, you're going to go beyond that and we're going to think a little bit beyond that and think about other things the mitochondria does. So just briefly, give me a quick overview of what the mitochondria does in addition to its energy sort of producing. Yeah, certainly. So, uh, you know, thank you for having me on your show. I'm uh, a fan, so it's it's nice to be here. But let me tell you about a little bit about my perspective on the mitochondria. And um, I will say that what I'm going to say is by no means intended to be an inclusive list of all the things that the mitochondria do. Uh, we would need a lot longer than the length of a normal <laughs> podcast to get through that. But I'm going to, my lab tends to focus on three main areas. So one is the kind of bioenergetic side. So the use of oxygen to generate the energy currency for the cell, the ATP. Then there's the production of reactive oxygen species or free radicals. And, you know, in the past that has been viewed, well, at least 20 years ago, people were viewing that as very negatively that, you know, all free radicals are bad. Um, they cause aging, they cause damage, they cause disease. Um, but, you know, that concept has evolved a lot. And in more recent times, there's been some really fascinating data showing that, you know, Free radicals are actually not always bad. And in some cases, they're actually really important signaling molecules. And to give you just an example of that, you know, there's data that's been coming out over a few years now showing that if you use high levels of antioxidants, so these are agents that can quench those free radicals uh, in the context of exercise training, you can actually blunt the exercise training adaptations. So that you know, isn't a very good thing. I think most of us would like to think that when we go and sweat and exercise, that we're actually going to see some upside to that once the yes. working out is done. So that's, those yeah. are two main major things that I we think about. I could talk about a third in the moment if you've got any questions that's, first. That's a nice one there. We, I had Carlos, uh, Carlos, uh, oh God, I can't remember his surname actually, a few, a few podcasts ago talking about reactive oxygen species and how they can be signaling molecules, as you say, Although I have to say, we did a few studies with um, reactive, blocking reactive oxygen species and also blocking nitric oxide, which is you know, another sort of free radical and, and it had no effect on training responses, but uh, maybe we didn't have high enough doses. So that's interesting. So so you're saying the mitochondria, yeah, so why don't you tell us a bit about what the mitochondria is doing um, sort of basally in terms of reactive oxygen species, you know, whether there's many much in there, 
whether it increases with exercise, as you've touched on, and maybe also, you know, with diabetes. So, so maybe thinking about sort of acute increases in reactive oxygen species versus sort of chronically elevated um, levels, especially, I guess, with the mitochondria. Yeah, so I think the first thing that I'd like to mention is that it's under kind of those basal, you know, when you're sitting, not exercising, um, you know, in a sedentary state, that that's when your mitochondria seem to produce the highest levels of, of reactive oxygen species. And once the mitochondria start to rev up, start consuming more oxygen to generate more of the ATP, the level of these free radicals actually drops. And so you might think during exercise that, you know, mitochondria are maybe not the source of the increase in, in free radicals or reactive oxygen species. That may be true. There are, of course, other enzymes that can generate reactive oxygen species, so it doesn't need to be just the mitochondrion. But I would say that an area that needs further study is looking at what happens to mitochondrial reactive oxygen species generation at the cessation of exercise. So you can think of you know, a normal exercise response being that, okay, you start to move, that causes feedback to the brain that then the brain says, okay, we need to get more blood flow to the muscle because it's active. And so your, your heart starts pumping out more, the blood flow going to the muscle increases. Um, so that's all great. And, you know, then the mitochondria are using that, that now increased level of oxygen delivery. Everybody's happy, but you stop exercise, muscle stops contracting and the blood flow doesn't immediately go back to baseline. It stays elevated for a period afterwards. And so at that point, you know, the demand on the mitochondria to generate ATP is not what it was during the actual contractions. And so it's possible at that point, you might have an increased generation of reactive oxygen species. And that's an area that certainly I would like to see some new data to address that mm -hmm. question, because I certainly don't know what happens. <laughs> but my that's speculation is it would increase. Yes, that's, that's interesting. And and as you touched on with exercise, so there has been evidence, and Carlos again has, has some nice studies on this, that the mitochondria is actually, uh, even though there's reactive oxygen species being produced during exercise, it looks like it's not the mitochondria. So as you said, it looks like it actually goes down. And then you've got it coming from other places, such as NADPH oxidase on the on the plasma membrane, et cetera. But what about, um, and I know this isn't necessarily your main area, but people with type 2 diabetes, um, is, it, is it true to say that sort of short increase in reactive oxygen species during exercise, as you say, can be signaling and beneficial? But if you've got um, elevated reactive oxygen species, such as in people with diabetes, is it true that that could be coming from the mitochondria and then that's then actually having negative effects? Yeah, I think there is some evidence that under basal conditions, the level of, of free radical or reactive oxygen species production by the mitochondria and skeletal muscle and somebody who's diabetic is elevated. So whether that reaches levels that are, you know, harmful to the cell, I, I think that's the part that's been a lot harder to grapple mm -hmm. with. And um, I'm not convinced that we have a definitive answer as yet, but there might be others who would disagree with that point. And I don't do diabetes as my main level of research. So I would defer to the experts yep. on that one. Perfect. Okay. Now, I know the other one, so we're leading towards your, your big interest, and I know you've been writing all these grants lately. Thanks for, uh, for uh, you know, you just got them in, you know, got one of them in, and you've gone straight on to this, so thanks for that. But uh, we're heading towards your interest in uh, mitochondrial permeability transition, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But I know a big uh, factor with that is the calcium levels in the mitochondria. So why don't, you, why don't we talk a little bit, you know, we've talked about um, you know, basal reactive oxygen species increases with exercise, et cetera. Um, but what about calcium? What's, what's happening with sort of basal calcium levels in the mitochondria and then with exercise and maybe with disease? So let me start by just mentioning that because one of the key components to think about is that the mitochondria is a two membraned structure, right? So you've got the outer mitochondrial membrane and then you've got the inner mitochondrial membrane or the cristae. And it's that inner membrane where the mitochondrial respiratory chain enzymes are embedded. And what's happening in the normal process of generating ATP is those mitochondrial respiratory chain enzymes are pumping protons, hydrogen ions, from the mitochondrial matrix 
into the space in between the two mitochondrial membranes, that intermembrane space. And so that's what's generating that proton motive force that the ATP synthase then harnesses to generate ATP. So a key component here is that that inner mitochondrial membrane is largely impermeable under most circumstances. So now let's bring calcium into the equation. Mitochondria are a really important uh, structure for buffering calcium in, in various tissues. There's less known about the significance of mitochondria buffering calcium in skeletal muscle, but there is some data there. We know that there's mitochondria that are in very close contact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is of course the structure that's, that's releasing calcium into the, into the uh, skeletal muscle during contractions. So those mitochondria are definitely seeing, quote unquote, seeing uh, high uh, transients of calcium during excitation contraction uh, cycles. Um, and so that's kind of the normal state for the mitochondrion. But if calcium levels were to become chronically elevated, such that the mitochondria takes up more and more of that calcium, it can actually reach levels that are, uh, well, they lead to assembly of a pore. And so this pore is called the mitochondrial permeability transition pore. And um, that pore then uh, allows the dissipation of that proton motive force back into the mitochondrial matrix and a host of other changes. But I'll give uh, you a moment to maybe have some follow-up <laughs> on those points. All right, great. So, so we talked about reactive oxygen species going up and down with contraction, um, and then you're, you're thinking calcium, it's the same sort of thing. So when you've got calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum for the contraction, you're actually getting some calcium getting into them. Do you, do you actually know how does the, the calcium get into the mitochondria and it's actually getting in and out with every contraction? Is that what they're thinking? Well, you can imagine that measuring that during a muscle contraction is, is fairly challenging. Uh, the main issue is is basically the fact that your your uh, image frame, if you were going to try to visualize this on a microscope, is that as the muscles contracting, your image frame moves. Yes. So it's it's not a trivial thing to try to image these things in real time, and that's probably why we don't have, you know, as much information about this. But certainly, I think it's reasonable to 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 think that with these transient elevations in calcium during sarcoplasmic re release of the of the of the calcium and then its sequestration of that calcium in between contractions that that's going to result in transients in calcium within the mitochondria as well so i think that's normal uh, even if we don't have definitive data showing it um so that's a normal situation and that calcium uptake by the mitochondria under what i guess we would call these physiological levels of calcium transients it actually helps activate some of the enzymatic machinery in the mitochondria to make them better able to generate the ATP. So it helps activate the enzymes. All right. So it sounds like it's um, you know similar with reactive oxygen species, nitric oxide, calcium. You know, you need to have you know, if you've got none almost, that's bad. You want to have sort of normal transient increases. That's good. But then perhaps if you have chronically elevated levels, then that that's going to cause damage. So so what happens? In um, so with this mitochondrial uh, permeability transition, what happens when you have elevated calcium levels, and especially, and I think the reactive oxygen species also play a role. And what causes that? You know, the the sort of ongoing. So this is not, you know, because this is an exercise podcast. So we're not really talking about exercise causing this, even though the calcium is going to come in in and out. It's not really causing problems with the permeability, is that right? Correct. So your mitochondria has got a you know a capacity to handle that that calcium under normal circumstances, and everything is you know copacetic. But there are circumstances, as you've alluded to, where the calcium levels might become chronically elevated. To give you one example, if you were to surgically de denervate a muscle, and that can be done experimentally. So in a, a mouse or a rat model, you can cut the sciatic nerve, and then the muscles distal to that cut. So these would be the, the muscles of the lower uh, limb uh, below the knee. Those muscles would lose their innervation. And what we find is that the calcium transients, or sorry, the calcium uh, levels in the, in the myocytes becomes chronically elevated. And so that can then be a signal that 
the mitochondria take up that calcium. And you'd asked earlier about how that happens. Um, so, you know, one of the, the transport mechanisms is something called the voltage dependent anion channel or VDAC. So that's a protein that's, that's embedded in the outer mitochondrial membrane. And that takes up calcium into that intermembrane space. From there, the main route of calcium to get into the matrix is the mitochondrial calcium uniporter. There are some other pumps as well, but the MCU, as it is known, is the primary means of getting that calcium from that intermembrane space into the matrix. And it's in the matrix where if the calcium level gets too high, that leads to assembly of this permeability transition pore. Okay. And and to get back about to, to what we normally think about the mitochondria doing, so producing ATP using, you know, carbohydrates, fats, et cetera. Um, so you were saying that if we think about carbohydrates, so, you know, C6, H12, O6, so six carbons, 12 hydrogens. So you have this electron transport. So basically you're moving the electrons and the hydrogens along these proteins on the on the um, mitochondrial membrane. And and the the sort of energy that's in the food is 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 used to pump hydrogens on uh, across the membrane as they go through these these things. Oh, they're often called uh, many of them are cytochrome. So they actually got chrome, which is iron in them. And that's part of the reason why, why people need to have iron in their diet. And and the idea is that that membrane permeability is not that's not letting anything through, and you're pumping the hydrogens through these these cytochromes and things, but not through the membrane. And then it builds up, and then the hydrogens come in through the ATP synthase, as it sounds like, and it produces ATP. But the point is, to have all this working well, you need an impermeable mitochondrial membrane so that you're not mucking inner up that, that nice inner membrane. So you're not mucking up that nice uh, gradient. So you want the hydrogen ions to build up and then come in. Now, what happens if, if, you, if that uh, mitochondrial transition, a permeability transition pore, is sort of starting to open up? Does that actually mess up that that membrane sort of difference, and then you don't get as much hydrogen what pumped out, and then coming back in, or it gets pumped out but doesn't come in properly, or like what happens, and then you don't get as much energy, or well, as many yeah. ATPs formed, I guess. So great question. And so yes, when that pore opens, the protons that have been pumped into that intermembrane space can now leak back into the matrix. Mm -hmm. okay. And if that if that pore stays open long enough that can actually result in collapse of that mitochondrial membrane potential, which then causes swelling of the mitochondrion that then can rupture the outer membrane of the mitochondrion. And at that point, all the constituents that are in the mitochondrion, which includes reactive oxygen species, it includes things like cytochrome C um, and a variety of other things. And once these get into the cytoplasm of the cell, they can activate cell death pathways. So apoptotic, necroptotic pathways. Whether that's the consequence in skeletal muscle is just not as clear because there's not been nearly as much study of this event in skeletal muscle as in other tissues like the heart, for example. Okay. So so would this be like a slow, well, I don't know, slow, like, you know, slow things in biology might be three milliseconds or all we know, but is this like a, a continuous, so once things start to go astray, we could talk some more about why. Um, you you would start to lose that that um, permeability difference that um, differential. So then you'd start to have like an energy problem, I guess, initially, yeah, um, because you're not getting that nice hydrogen gradient, um, and production of ATP would be less. And then what was the swelling? What was the? Tell me, explain why it starts to swell and then can burst. Right. So the the idea is that the slippage of those protons, those hydrogen ions from that intermembrane space back into the matrix occurs sufficiently quickly that it, it's causing an osmotic stress. So it's a pH shift. And that shift is sufficient to basically cause the mitochondria to take up water from the intercellular, from the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, cytoplasm, which is what causes the mitochondrion to swell. And so as, again, if that wow. becomes sufficient, you can get rupture of that outer membrane. Oh, so it's just the you're saying the pH. So it's just the hydrogen ions, the acidity itself, um, that's causing that. I was imagining all sorts of other stuff that's going on. So you have a buildup of calcium, and why? Again, you may have already said this. Why is the calcium um, building up? 
we know why is that does that happen in particular diseases or oh, sorry you already said about um if you de-innovate um so that's like a, a pretty uh extreme example of having no muscle contraction or is it a lack of nerve input do you know what do you know what actually even causes that well i think they believe it's the it's the lack of that that motor neuron muscle fiber communication that results in that chronically elevated calcium i don't know that it's fully understood, but that's, I think, one of the things that contributes to that. You do get some changes in the expression of, of proteins in the muscle fiber in response to loss of that motor neuron when you get that, you know, cutting of the sciatic nerve. That may also contribute to that calcium dyshomeostasis. But in other conditions, and just to give you one example that I'm interested in, aging, uh, mm -hmm. there's pretty good evidence that the sarcoplasmic reticulum um, and the ryanidine receptors, they become leaky. And so they, you know, normally the calcium would be kept under pretty, you know, close uh, monitoring and, and kept where it should be within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But in the context of aging, uh, there's some evidence that, the, that these ryanidine receptors are becoming leaky. And so you have this chronically elevated intracellular calcium. Now, is that enough to induce permeability transition? Maybe not by itself, but there can be other things going on in the context of aging that might make it easier for permeability transition to occur. And I could get into that if you're interested. Okay. And, and is it right? I saw in your notes you sent me that the, with aging, um, even at a given calcium, it, it becomes more likely to have a problem with the mitochondrial uh, permeability transition pause or the transition itself. So at the same calcium, uh, you have more trouble as you age, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So it was, I think, in about 1998 that the first studies were done looking at, I think it was brain and liver. And what they found is there's a kind of a classic assay that you can do. It's called a calcium retention capacity assay. And so what's done in this assay is they'll take typically isolated mitochondria from a tissue. In this case, let's say it's liver and the brain. And they then put them in a cuvette and they titrate in sequential steps of, of increased calcium. And what normally happens is for the first several editions is the mitochondria will, there'll be a kind of like a transient uh, increase in the amount of, of calcium that you see, but then it gets buffered by the, by the mitochondria as they take it up. So comes back down to a plateau. Then researcher adds another bolus of calcium and repeats the sequence. And so you do this several times, and after several additions, what will happen is the maximum capacity of the mitochondria to take up that calcium will be reached. You then end up with an opening of that permeability transition pore, and the calcium just comes flooding out of the mitochondria. So that's a pretty traditional assay. And so that's the assay that was done back in the late 1990s, and what they found is that less calcium was needed to get to that point where the mitochondria or opened and release the calcium back out into the cuvette. Okay. Now I know you said, um, you know, again, the de innovation of, of um, mice or rats, if it was. That's that's a pretty. Uh, I guess that that is something that would could develop over days, and, and you know, of after the de innovation. But I know again in your notes you were talking about ischemia reperfusion injury, which is a, a shorter sort of thing. Up, for example, with a heart attack. Do you want to just explain? what um, ischemia reperfusion injury is, and then what effect it, it can have on this mitochondrial uh, permeability transition. Sure. Well, please stop me if at any point you've got questions. But um, in the context of somebody who's having an ischemic event in their heart, so you've got a blockage in one of the main you know, uh, vessels supplying oxygen to the heart, and of course the heart is contracting, um, has to for you to actually be living, so that muscle is is got an energetic stress on it, but it it's not able to the mitochondria within that muscle are not able to generate the ATP that's needed because of that blockage in the blood supply and therefore the oxygen delivery to that tissue. So that's the initial insult, and so, but once the the blood flow is restored, so let's say that this person is lucky enough that you know they get uh, to a hospital and they start treating them with plaque busting uh, chemicals. Um, so now that plaque is broken up, the blockage is removed, flow is restored to that formerly 
ischemic region of the heart. And so now you've got a, a big influx of oxygen and that is a catalyst for a big increase in production of reactive oxygen species by the mitochondria. And that's when things really go to <laughs> go, go bad because that big increase in mitochondrial reactive oxygen species production with the restoration of flow causes permeability transition to occur. So that pore that we've been talking about assembles, mm -hmm. the mitochondria swell and they rupture and they activate those cell death pathways. Okay. And in the context of that ischemia reperfusion injury, there's very good data showing that if you can prevent the mitochondria from undergoing this permeability transition or limit the extent to which they do that, you can dramatically reduce the amount of tissue damage resulting from that ischemia reperfusion event. And, and how do they do that? Do you know? Uh, so there's a variety of different chemicals that have been developed. Um, so again, I'm going to try to introduce this a little bit slowly. So there's a the main protein that's been identified that will regulate the amount of calcium that's needed to cause opening of this permeability transition pore is a protein called cyclophilin D. So this is a, a mitochondrial protein. And this protein, um, it binds with a component, maybe more than one component, but so let's just say component or components of the permeability transition pore and favors its opening. And um, so we can use drugs that can target or inhibit this cyclophilin D and prevent mm -hmm. it from binding with those pore components and then favoring the pore opening. And so if you interfere with cyclophilin D, you basically raise the amount of calcium that's needed to cause opening of that pore. Okay. And is cyclophilin D increased in you know situations like high limb, uh, I was going to say high limb suspension, but... Uh... Cutting the cutting the nerve to the hind limb, et cetera. Is it does that fit with that? I don't believe that the amount of cyclophilin D is actually increasing per se um, in context of that. But what is ha happening is so the activity or the ability of that cyclophilin D to bind with the pore components is regulated by modifications to that protein. And these modifications include adding phosphate groups, so phosphorylation of cyclophilin D or adding acetyl groups, acetylation of that cyclophilin D. So both of those modifications can favor the ability of that cyclophilin D to interact with the pore components and cause opening of that pore. Okay. So that, that, that makes, um, so it's interesting. I was just thinking how, you know, there's evidence, um, how you having an increase in the mitochondrial uh, permeability transition pore uh, can be damaging, but also you've said there's evidence going the other way. So it's nice to have it sort of both ways that if you can inhibit, you know, reduce the likelihood of the mitochondrial trans transition, uh, permanently transition by these agents that block cyclophilin A, uh, D, then that's beneficial. Now, another thing I saw in your notes was, was also um, if you can inhibit mitochondrial permanently transition, it can be beneficial in various muscular dystrophies as well did you want to talk to us about that so so just to clarify because i kind of stumbled a bit it's one thing showing you know that something can cause increase in mitochondrial permeability transition and that's a bad thing but then it kind of adds extra weight to that by showing that if you inhibit that it's a good thing certainly so the muscular dystrophy data that i think is amongst the most exciting uh actually comes from paulo bernardi's lab so paulo is a a really eminent researcher in the context of the permeability transition poor um, and terrific scientist, terrific individual as well. Uh, and what uh, Paulo's group have shown is they have a, a studied a zebrafish model of uh, that lacked dystrophin. So this is kind of a model of the most severe of the muscular dystrophies, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so in these zebrafish that lack dystrophin, they develop muscle pathology that's you know similar to what one would see in, in patients with Duchenne's. But if they use an agent, so they've developed uh, some new uh, permeability transition pore inhibitors, um, they're actually not entirely certain of the mechanism by which they operate. But what they do know is it doesn't seem to need cyclophilin D, which is interesting. So they're acting through a different mechanism. But these agents, when administered to the zebrafish model, can 
largely prevent the muscle pathology that results from the loss of dystrophin. Hmm. That's very interesting. I remember again, I my um I've done a whole bunch of stuff with nitric oxide, and that was interesting because again it's a free radical, so it sort of ties in with your active oxygen species stuff. Uh oh, who was it? T Tidball. As a researcher showed that if you have um uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, part of the problem um, with them is the reduction of N loss, which is producing nitric oxide. So when he actually mated the MDX mice, which is a, 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 a mouse model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, with the N loss overexpressing mice, so you put the N loss back in, that he rescued like 50% of their pathology. So it's interesting. It just made me think about, about it when you said this, you know, different mechanisms. So so the MDX mice have not only no dystrophin, but because um, NNOS binds to the centripetal dystrophin complex, the NNOS is reduced. So if you put the NNOS back in, you know, you can res rescue part of the pathology. But anyway, that's a, a, very, a weird sort of uh, side, side uh, twist. Yeah, so, so again, with nitric oxide and thinking of um, reactive oxygen species, indeed, quite often people talk about reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, so they sort of go hand in hand. Um, I'm just wondering, because, you know, you've talked about the, the role of elevated calcium and also reactive oxygen species. I'm just wondering, do they tend to go hand in hand or can you have the mitochondrial permeability transition just with an increase in calcium, no change in ROS? Can you have, uh, can it happen if you've just got an increase in ROS or do they always sort of go hand in hand or does it depend on different you know, situations? Or... Well, to my knowledge, there's actually no circumstances where you get opening of that permeability transition pore without calcium. So calcium seems to be the essential component. Now, what is modified is the amount of calcium that it takes to trigger that permeability transition. And my understanding is that elevation of reactive oxygen species reduces the amount of calcium that you need to trigger permeability transition. So that's the link. Okay. Now, the other thing I was thinking was, you know, we we're trying to get people to think beyond the normal ways of thinking about mitochondria. A lot of people will be thinking about mitochondria as these sort of like little sausages in the muscle, you know, because that's what you see when you do cross sections. But we know that it's really like a reticulum that sort of, you know, goes all, all through the muscle. So when we're talking about this mitochondrial permeability transition, are we talking about it happening in like the whole reticulum at the same time? Or is it is it sort of happening in one part of the mitochondria and then that's then sort of causing the whole mitochondria? Or I guess, does the whole sort of reticulum, the whole mitochondria sort of swell and burst or is it just sort of part of it or how does that work so the the simple answer to that is it depends so it depends on the circumstances i would say first off permeability transition is shouldn't be thought of exclusively in a pathological context so let's imagine you've got part of this you've got this electron transport chain or sorry you've got this mitochondrial reticulum that you've just mentioned and let's say that a portion of of that reticulum for whatever reason, get some damage, whatever it is, maybe too much reactive oxygen species or, or something else. So you get damage to a portion of that reticulum. So maybe at that point, the mitochondrial uh, uh, start to undergo this permeability transition event. Maybe they start to take up more calcium, what have you. And so they start to undergo this permeability transition event. So let's say that this is a localized phenomenon that's specific to this region with, you know, kind of dysfunctional electron transport chain function. So what would normally happen is that part of that uh, reticulum would actually undergo fission. And so you'd now fizz off this little region of, of that network that has the dysfunction and that, that mitochondrion now, which has undergone permeability transition, that is a target or a, an activator for, for the mitophagy process. So if we're, recruitment of, of uh, the autophagosome membranes, which will then engulf that, that mitochondrion and recycle it, for lack of a better word. So that's the normal function. And so you can see, in this case, you've got you know, permeability transition happening in a very small part of that whole reticulum. But in the context of you know, a scenario, a disease scenario, where you've got chronic elevation of calcium and or you know, maybe you've got high levels of reactive oxygen, oxygen species in the context of that ischemia reperfusion event. That would be a scenario where probably you've got permeability transition occurring in a lot of the network at the same time. And again, I keep I keep thinking because I've 
I always think about glucose metabolism. It's my, in my main research. Um, I keep thinking about do people with type two again. I don't know if people know this. People with type two diabetes, for example, do they have? You know, we talked about. It sounds like they've got increased reactive oxygen species production by mitochondria. Do they also have like a basal sort of elevated calcium? And and does that then result in a slight problem with the mitochondrial transition and maybe affects their energy production? You know, is it like a continuum thing, or is it sort of like everything's fine and then boom? Well, I think the best evidence that addresses that question um, comes from a group out of out of Russia that had looked at the one of these chemical agents that uh, inhibits cyclophilin D, and by doing so raises the amount of calcium that's needed to trigger permeability transition. And so it was a mouse model of, of uh, diabetes. I think it was a high fat feeding model that, that they were using. And in that context, long-term administration of this agent, and I think the agent was alisporavir. So this is one of the kind of new classes of cyclophilin D inhibitors. And so chronic administration of that actually was protective uh, for the muscle in the context of that, of that high fat feeding induced diabetes. Okay. Actually, one thing I think about though is um, Fleming Dealer showed years ago now that people with type two diabetes have um, reduced mitochondrial function, but it appeared that it was because they had reduced mitochondria, um, you know, volume. So that per mitochondrial volume, their mitochondrial function was normal. I don't know if that's still the thinking or not. Um, so just to clarify that, that you know, you can have reduced mitochondrial function, but it might be because you've just got less mitochondria generally, and each mitochondria is fine, or you might have reduced mitochondrial function where you've got normal levels, but each mitochondria is, is function is down. Do you know what the latest thinking on that is, and if it fits with your uh, our discussions or not? Yeah. Well, I, I know a lot less about diabetes, but I can yeah. give you an example in the context of aging, where what we typically see, and we've done this both in our rodent studies as well as in the human studies. So I'll talk to the human studies right now. And what we find there is that, the, the and not everybody will agree with this point, but I can tell you our data and I'll tell you what the data is, and then you can make up your own mind. Um, if we look for voltage dependent anion channel, so VDAC, I've mentioned that as a calcium transporter that's found in the outer mitochondrial membrane. So we can use that as a, as a marker of mitochondrial content. And if we look at that in elderly men versus young men, we find that they don't necessarily have less mitochondria. If anything, they tend to have elevated levels of VDAC. So if you take that as a marker of mitochondrial content, they actually have more mitochondria. But if you look at the respiratory capacity of the mitochondria in an aged muscle, it's lower. So what that tends to, the way that we would interpret that is that would suggest that it's not less mitochondria, it's actually less functional mitochondria in the context of aging men that's resulting in that lower capacity to generate ATP aerobically for that muscle. And that's different than what we see in, in elderly women where we actually see that the reduction in mitochondrial content, and again, VDAC is a protein that we've used. Um, and we find that that reduction in, in VDAC level completely accounts for the reduction in muscle uh, respiratory capacity. Uh, so there's a difference, a sex difference in the context of age. And tell me, you said it was controversial, which is good of you, because I wouldn't have known otherwise. So if 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 a particular person was here, I didn't even know who it would be, what would they say to that? Would they say, well, the VDAC's not a good indicator? Well, you know, like what's the controversial bit? What would they be saying to you? Like, hang on a minute, you know. Well, you know, there's a, a lot of different uh, proteins and even enzyme activities that one could use as a marker of mitochondrial content. And so part of this comes down to, you know, the only real gold standard for mitochondrial content is electron microscopy. So you can actually say, mm -hmm. okay, this is the amount of structure that's there. Short of that, people are, are forced to use, you know, a variety of marker proteins. So we're dealing with the limitations of any one of these proteins in terms of their ability to accurately represent the total content of the, of the mitochondria of the muscle fibers. So that's the limitation. So I think the controversy is really probably methodological. 
So depending on the marker you use, you may say it's no, it's going down with aging or it's not going down. Um, but I will say that there's rodent data and this is just done in male uh, rats. And they do see that the amount of mitochondria, so volume density of mitochondria in advanced age. So this is in a 36 month old rat, which I would in, for this particular strain of rat say would be equivalent to about an 80 to 85 year old human. And so in the, at that advanced age, they do not see a reduction in mitochondrial volume density in the muscle, but they clearly see a de deficit in respiratory capacity of the muscle. So there's rodent data that parallels what I'm telling you we see in, in the human. I wonder why you, um, I'm just wondering why you use VDAC. So people, when you say people tend to use, you know, they they use other things so, such as citrate synthase activity or um, mitochondrial DNA, things like that. Do you get the same results if you if you normalize to that or? Well, so first off, mitochondrial DNA, um, there was a Swedish group several years ago now, looked at a variety of different markers of, of mitochondrial content and actually mitochondrial DNA copy number was amongst the worst. <laughs> okay. So it's not a very good indicator of mitochondrial mm -hmm. content. Um, so, you know, again, there'll probably be people who, who uh, mm -hmm. poo poo my suggestion of that, but um, be yelling at the we could get into it more if we wanted. <laughs> okay. All right. Now um, thinking about your, you're talking about sex differences there. Um, so one thing, another thing people may not appreciate is the mitochondria has various receptors um, in it, including estrogen receptors. So do you think, um, maybe just flesh that out a little bit, so thyroid hormone receptors, glu uh, glucocorticoid receptors, maybe just flesh that out a little bit, just just the fact that the mitochondria must be doing other things and, and responding to other sort of signals than what we tend to think about. Yeah, well, of course, that gets back to our original Point about you know the different roles that the mitochondria play, and I, I think the fact that mitochondria do express so many different proteins, gives them an opportunity to really sense the intracellular environment in a unique way that's different than a lot of other structures, and because of that, you know it's really in tune with what's going on in the cell and can then adapt its function, probably in subtle ways that we really don't have the technology to accurately represent, uh, but nonetheless change the function in ways that actually matters to the cell, hopefully help it cope with the circumstances that it's facing. Now, I remember thinking about calcium buildup. I saw years and years ago, I don't know if this is still a thing or not, but is there evidence that calcium can precipitate? So precipitates where, if you think about it, it's um, still a bit, sort of, instead of being in solution, it can sort of come out of solution like more granules or something, you know, that's just to give people an idea of what I'm talking about with precipitation. Is that still considered a thing, you know, and is it playing a role in what you've been doing? Yeah, I think that idea has been around for some time. Of course, calcium can precipitate um, with inorganic phosphate in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so it makes sense that if both of those exist in the mitochondria, and they, they might well precipitate there as well. So that idea has been around for a while. But I'm aware of one particular study that I think came out in 2021, where they were trying to put some functional consequence to this in, in heart. And what they were showing was that at levels of calcium that were not sufficient to cause opening of the permeability transition pore, uh, there were seeing some uh, precipitation of calcium with inorganic phosphate. And that, that if they could inhibit that process, that actually would benefit the mitochondrial function. So in other words, putting a bit of a negative spin on this precipitation event. Okay, great. So, um, you, you had in your notes that you were saying uh, that you sent to me that the mitochondrial permeability transition has been studied a lot in sort of what are called mononuclear cells, so cells that just have one nucleus. Why don't you tell us about um, skeletal muscle, um, you know, whether they're mononuclear or not, um, and uh, why that's important. And, and so, so why you can't necessarily assume the results that people have obtained previously are the same in muscle. Sure. So the, you know, the, the real crux of things is that if, you've, if your cell has one nucleus and you undergo a programmed cell death event like apoptosis, one of the consequences is that the nucleus itself will undergo an apoptotic event. So enzymes like apoptosis-inducing factor, or AIF, and endonuclease G, or endo-G, 
are released from the mitochondria when they undergo permeability transition, and they go to the nucleus, and they actually trigger degradation of the nuclear DNA. So during a typical cell death pathway that involves the mitochondria, that would be a consequence as you basically blow up that nucleus. So of course, for that cell, that's a terminal event, no nucleus, no RNA, <laughs> and basically that's, that's it, you're done for. So, but skeletal muscle, you know, during development, you've got these individual myoblasts, which themselves are mononucleated, but they fuse together to form the myotubes that then eventually form mature muscle fibers. So mature muscle fibers have got hundreds of nuclei. And so, you know, if you've got mitochondria that undergo permeability transition and release those factors I've already mentioned that cause maybe that a nucleus to, to be lost, what's the consequence of that for skeletal muscle? And the answer seems to be, we don't really know. Um, I think what we can say is that if you lose a single nucleus, that's certainly not going to cause death of the, of the muscle fiber because you've got Thank many, you. many other nuclei and not only that, you can replace the nuclei that are lost through donation from the myogenic precursor cells, also known as satellite cells. They just fuse with the mu damaged muscle fiber and, and give them the nucleus. So that's a big difference there. So because of that, the consequences of permeability transition for skeletal muscle, they're just far less understood because cell death as a, as a concept is, is a lot more complicated for a multinucleated uh, cell. Okay. And that has been a big driving force for us to kind of go back to, you know, first principles to try to understand what this event might be doing in skeletal muscle. Okay. Well, actually, you mentioning satellite cells and the nucleus, I, I should I should promote another podcast as well. So the one that Benjamin Miller was on, um, he was talking about uh, whether you need satellite cells and whether the nucleus can kick in and things. I won't, I won't do too much of a spoiler on that one. Okay, just going to Twitter here, I just want to see. So Richie said, uh, is there any evidence, so we've already talked about this, but this, at the end it's a bit extra. Is there any evidence in humans that skeletal muscle mitochondria become more susceptible towards undergoing permeability transition, a transition with aging? And if so, is there any link with denervation and or fiber loss? Okay, great questions. So first off, yes, there is evidence that the mitochondria become more sensitive. So in other words, they require less calcium to trigger permeability transition with aging in both men and women. And we see this in our rodent model, model studies as well. Now, in terms of the consequence, that's been a lot trickier to try to nail down. And we do not have definitive answers yet. But what I can tell you is that if we take single muscle fibers and we make them undergo permeability transition, so there are chemicals that we can use that will promote permeability transition, and when we do that, we can actually cause those muscle fibers to atrophy. So we published that data a couple of years ago now, um, and we're now trying to move to some in vivo models where, where we can hopefully show that this is actually occurring in vivo as well. Um, we also have some unpublished data showing that when you trigger permeability transition um, in single muscle fibers, you can actually cause disassembly of the receptors that are on the muscle fiber side of that, of the end plate. So where the neuromuscular junction um, provides the communication between the motor neuron and the muscle fiber. And so we think that it could be a contributor to instability of that neuromuscular junction in the context of aging. But at this point, that's a hypothesis, not a proven point. Okay. Well, that actually fits beautifully with the next uh, Twitter question I had from Sean. Uh, Requesting insight into the discrepancies between human and rodent literature regarding neuromuscular junction morphology, so you're just talking about uh, motor end plate, and the potential mechanisms, perhaps mitochondria, which may underlie these differences. I'm not sure if you have uh, thoughts on that. Sure. So I, I think that the, uh, the the Twitter question originates for from some literature that came out, I think, in 2017 in cell metabolism that suggested that the neuromuscular junction in the context of aging in humans was not undergoing the same sorts of morphological alterations that one sees in rodent models. Now that study in particular is, is interesting because number one, it actually contradicts some earlier studies that have been done with cadaver tissues. And that was actually the basis on which they kind of argued 
for why their data was different. But I think an overlooked reason for why their data may be different is actually that they studied uh, tissues, muscle tissues, from uh, the amputated limbs of patients with long-term peripheral vascular disease. Oh. And so that's significant because ischemia reperfusion events are pretty well known mm -hmm. in the context of skeletal muscle. So this would be in patients with, with uh, uh, chronic peripheral vascular disease to cause alterations to that neuromuscular junction. So what I'm telling you is that independent of aging, the disease itself is causing perturbation to that structure. So if, if that's happening, then the effect of age will be obscured by the disease. So I think that's the biggest reason to, to not really think that that's the definitive word on what's happening in humans in the context of aging in the neuromuscular junction. And I can say here that there's a group from Montreal, Richard Robitaille, Gilles Guspieu, and, and others, who have presented data at conferences showing uh, they've been using an EMG guided approach to obtain muscle biopsies closer to where the muscle end plate is uh, located from humans. And when they do that, they get muscle biopsies that are enriched in neuromuscular junctions. And so this is in otherwise healthy people, not people with peripheral vascular disease. And what they're finding is that with aging, they are seeing alterations in the neuromuscular junction structure with age that at least in some respects parallel what's been shown in the context of aging in rodent models. So I think there's we're going to find that there's a lot more harmony than disharmony uh, based on some of this new data that's emerging. That's interesting. I've had, I've had I think, 33 muscle biopsies, but I'm quite happy. I think I don't know if I'd be that keen on them going for the motor end plate. <laughs> Uh, well, as I said, it's just close to the end plate, closer. Close to the end plate. Okay. Yeah. Now, talk about the end plate. You actually said the other thing you mentioned, you said you've got some unpublished data uh, in relation to mitochondrial permeability transition and the acetylcholine receptor cluster. So maybe if you can talk about, if you want to talk about that, it's unpublished. Yeah. Um, and, and keep it kind of simple because we're getting a little bit nitty gritty here. But yeah. I, I brought it up. Yeah, so it's... It's been a few years, um, I think it was around 2014 or 2015, that a, a study came out that suggested that caspase 3 is a, a, a protease that, that we tend to think about it mainly in the context of apoptosis. But in this particular study, they were interested in caspase 3 in the context of, of denervation and you know, neuromuscular junction alterations. And what they were finding is that activated caspase 3 was resulting in removal of the acetylcholine receptors from the cluster at the muscle end plate. And at that time, they hadn't considered whether permeability transition might be an upstream mechanism. And the reason that we think that that's a, a logical extension is that I, you know, I talked several, several moments back in, our, in this podcast about during permeability transition, when that mitochondrial outer membrane ruptures, one of the constituents that's released from the mitochondrion is a protein called cytochrome C. So you've talked about cytochromes a little bit. So this is you know, part of that shuttling of the electrons between the different electron transport chain enzymes. Mm -hmm. um, so when that cytochrome C gets out into the cytoplasm, one of the things that it does is it can result in the activation of caspase three. And there's quite a few steps in there, but I, I'm not gonna go through that for now, but but it's well established that release of cytochrome C into the cytoplasm will increase caspase three activity. And so one of the first experiments we did was to look at caspase three activation, so activity levels using a fluorescent ass assay called a, a FLICA assay. And when we induced permeability transition in these single muscle fibers, we found that it increased caspase three activity. So we then looked at what was happening to the acetylcholine receptor cluster and we found that over a period of 12 hours, the acetylcholine receptors themselves were being uh, basically pulled out of the membrane and broken down. And that was a caspase three dependent mechanism. So if we inhibited permeability transition, we could prevent that from happening. Or if we inhibited caspase three directly, we could prevent that from happening. So, so basically what we've done is we've connected the dots between permeability transition and caspase three and the acetylcholine receptor cluster at the end plate. And caspase three is, is 
is considered a major regulator, major part of apoptosis, so programmed cell death. That's correct. Yep. Okay, great. Now, another thing you said is you've uh, been testing mitochondrial permeability transition as a mechanism underlying pathological alterations in skeletal muscle induced by cancer, so cachexia, for example. Did you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, so you alluded to all these grants I'm writing. Nice. So that's that's the uh, uh, a topic for most of these is trying to probe the significance of permeability transition as a pathological mechanism for the muscle alterations with cancer cachexia. So the the long and the short of it is that there's there's actually data from other cell types that in the context of cancer you see an increase in mitochondrial alterations that are consistent with what occurs with permeability transition. So there was already some evidence in the literature that suggested to us that it was highly likely that in the context of cancer, you would see an increase in permeability transition in skeletal muscle. So one of the first experiments that we've done is we've taken cancer cells, in this case, they were pancreatic cancer cells, and we grew them in a dish and we you know, incubated them over several days and then we took the media in which those cells were being grown. So this is what they call tumor conditioned media. So this media will contain whatever the uh, cancer cells have been secreting into it. Okay. And so if we take that tumor conditioned media and then we then use that to incubate muscle fibers, what we find is that after only 60 minutes of incubation within this tumor conditioned media, the amount of calcium that it takes to trigger permeability transition is reduced by, by at least half. And mm -hmm. to a degree, maybe even more than that, like maybe threefold less. Mm -hmm. So a marked reduction in the amount of calcium that is needed to trigger permeability transition uh, induced by these tumor conditioned uh, factors. So we then took single muscle fibers and we incubated them in the tumor condition media. And over a a 48 hour period, we were finding, you know, about a 30% reduction in muscle fiber size. So the fibers were atrophying in response to that tumor condition media. But if we used inhibitors of permeability transition, we tried two different ones, uh, we could prevent the atrophy. So that suggested that the atrophy that's occurring with the tumor condition media depended on permeability transition. So that's an area that we're really interested in going further with. And this is the cancer per se. It's not the like chemo chemotherapy related to cancer, uh, the cancer therapy. Or yeah, that's a great point as well. And you're correct. These experiments were just addressing the uh, the tumor related component of that equation. But we do have other data, and we have plans to look at more of these chemotherapeutic agents. But we've looked at one of these, um, doxorubicin, which is used largely in, in the context of breast, breast cancer uh, chemotherapy. And so this agent has been known for many years to have adverse impacts on the mitochondria, uh, contributes to problems in the heart, and there is some skeletal muscle uh, affect uh, with long-term uh, doxorubicin treatment. And so we started looking at whether or not it might be affecting permeability transition, and at least in our hands, we do see a reduction in the amount of calcium that's needed to trigger permeability transition uh, with doxorubicin. And similar to what I told you about the tumor condition media experiment, if we incubate single muscle fibers in, in a media that contains about one micromolar concentration of doxorubicin, we get atrophy and we can prevent that atrophy if we target the permeability transition. So we think permeability transition may be a common mechanism for causing muscle alterations, both with the chemotherapy as well as the tumor side of, of cancer cachexia. It'd be nice to add exercise. If you had conditioned media where you had the cells, you had the cancer um, media that may be customized chemotherapy, but also if you had like some sort of plasma for people who have exercised or not exercised, um, that'd be kind of nice. I can't get, I can't help always think about exercise, of course. No, I think that's a great suggestion, Glenn, there's actually people who have been looking at the effects of exercise in road models where they're, where they're treating chronically with chemotherapeutics, and they are finding that the exercise is protective for the muscle. I can't recall whether it's fully protective, but certainly to a degree, it's helping to prevent some of the damage that would otherwise occur with those chemotherapy agents.
Yeah. So another plug for another podcast is um, I had Catherine yeah. Schmidt on um, a while back talking about cancer and exercise. All right. Well, thank you very much for this. Um, what I'd like to do at the end is is to have some sort of takeaway messages um, for people from, yeah, from our chat. Yeah. So let me try to summarize. So the and I'll try to be succinct, which is not my usual way of doing things. Um, it's not mine. But either, the main actually. takeaway is quite it's quite interesting how many times <laughs> people have said, "How do you do a podcast? Are you interrupt them the whole time?" Well, I, I try not to. <laughs> So the main one would be just that if we think about the mitochondrion and, you know, if you have an interest in skeletal muscle and you think the mitochondria might be involved in whatever it is that you're studying in that muscle, I would just advocate for considering more than just the bioenergetics. Of course, bioenergetics are important, but there's a lot of other functions to the mitochondrion. And I would like to see a lot more done with some of those other facets that really haven't had the attention they deserve. Uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, please pay attention to the permeability transition space in the context of skeletal muscle. It's an area that we're deeply invested in. Uh, and I hope we're going to be generating a lot of data in the coming years to help illuminate really what this is doing in the context of muscle, in the context of aging, as well as, as, well as other conditions like cancer cachexia, as you mentioned. Well, hopefully your grants get up. Maybe Maybe the reviewers will see this podcast. That'd be nice. And that'll give you a little, little step up. I think you've done a great job. Um, you know, to be honest, I hopefully it wasn't uh, overly uh, clear, but I don't know. I didn't know much at all about this mitochondrial permeability transition. So it's been a really good um, education for me. And I think you've done a great job uh, making something that's, that's, you know, it's still kind of complicated, but made something that's, that's very complicated for, for quite a few people, uh, you know, accessible. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Okay, well, good on you. See you, mate. See you next time. Bye-bye. All right. All the best to you. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.